Welcome to the 50 cards RTX 3060 buying guide that you've been waiting for. I know I'm very late with this, but better late than never I guess. So let's get started. As usual, I'll explain how I compare the different cards. Firstly, I always emphasize on the power limits and the cooling as the most important aspects of a graphics card because the new GPUs these days can boost their clock speeds as high as they can as long as there's enough power and temperature headroom, which makes the boost clock specifications basically useless. So the factors that actually affects the performance is the power limit, which is often called the TGP or total graphics power, and the cooling performance. This is why Nvidia now mandates all brands to list their TGP specifications for their laptop GPUs because it really does matter a lot in terms of the performance that you're getting from the GPU. Of course, in desktops, the difference wouldn't be as severe as they are not exactly as TGP constrained, but there are real performance benefits from a higher TGP. Conveniently, the power limits, or the TGP, are easily checked for any cards by just checking their BIOS files, which are usually available on Tech Power Up's GPU BIOS database, which is really awesome, as long as someone actually uploaded the BIOS using the GPU-Z tool. Now cooling performance is also just as important as the boost algorithm since it automatically boosts the clock speeds higher when the GPU runs cooler. Not to mention, better coolers will usually mean lower noise levels and therefore a better user experience. PCB quality is also important as well, especially for the VRM or voltage regulator modules which is the circuitry that provides the correct voltage to the GPU. For most people, this won't matter too much, but the VRM's current capabilities are more important for anyone that wants to overclock, especially if it involves shun mods that remove the power limits. But for people who don't overclock, a stronger VRM will mean it'll be stressed less and will run cooler, as well as the fact that a stronger VRM will usually mean it's using better quality components which is going to last longer with all things equal. Also, I'm doing something new this time, which is that I'm putting a Google Sheets link in the description, which has all the GPUs listed and will be updated if I find new information, so be sure to check it out down below. So let's start with the power limits or TGP. If you notice, there's something weird going on. It seems like almost all the RTX 3060s have the same 170 watt default power limit, the only one that's different is surprisingly only the Gainward Ghost and Pallet Dual OC, which are basically the exact same cards. This can be seen as either a good thing, because that means that basically any card will perform the same at default, or a bad thing, because any card will perform the same at default, even the expensive models. Now I don't know why this is the case, because the higher end and more expensive cards actually have more power connectors, which would allow them to have higher TGPs, but maybe it's something that Nvidia enforces on all the manufacturers. Either way, I can prove using Tech Power Up's relative performance charts in their reviews that all the cards perform basically exactly the same, matching the RX 5700 XT and slightly above the reference spec RTX 3060, regardless of your differences in clock speed specifications, which is exactly just as I expected. I can also show you in Tech Power Up's reviews that the cards also achieve roughly the same clock speeds, which again is just as expected. So with this you can see that the TGP or the power limit is what matters a lot in terms of the clock speeds and therefore the performance that you get from the GPU. You can also see that the temperatures are really low even for the small dual fan cards like the EVGA XC, Zotac Amp, and Palette Dual OC which also tells me that the RTX 3060 isn't particularly hard to cool, and as such, there shouldn't be any trouble for any of the cards keeping the GPU at or below 70 degrees Celsius, which should be enough to maximize the boost clocks, even though if you go even lower in temperature, you get slightly higher boost clocks. So that said then, end of the video. Basically just pick any RTX 3060 you want, because they basically all perform the same. But if you really don't care, why are you even watching this video? Because you probably care about the minor details of each graphics card. So there's a lot more interesting things to cover. And because of that, let's move on to the maximum power limits, which actually has some differences among the different models. This will be very important for those wanting to overclock, as a higher power limit will let you overclock higher because that gives the GPU more headroom to clock the GPU higher. Of course, 
you can just do shunt mods to remove the power limit entirely. But the maximum power limit also serves to show how confident the manufacturers are in their card's quality as they will usually set it at a level that they deem safe for the VRMs. Here we can see that there's actually an awful lot of cards that don't let you increase the power limiter above the default TGP. This is probably because those cards have the same bare minimum PCB designs with the VRMs that are incapable of higher power usage and usually a very basic cooler design as well. These should be avoided if you have any plans to overclock as not being able to increase the power limit will mean basically nearly zero performance increase if you try to overclock. Then there's the 180 watt cards consisting of the MSI Gaming Series cards and the Palette Duel and its different iterations in the Game World Ghost and PNY Uprising and the Revel Epic X Duel. 10 watt increase over the TGP is really low and it's pretty much unlikely to net much of a performance increase, but this is better than nothing. I am quite a bit disappointed seeing the MSI Gaming Series, which many regard as high-end, end up being in this bracket, since they do have quite a substantial cooler that could deal with a much higher power limit. Then we can see most of the ASUS cards all have the exact same power limits at 187 watts, and along with the Zotac cards. And yes, I triple checked the BIOS files and that is correct, even the smaller ASUS cards have the same power limits as their tough gaming model. Here I am a bit disappointed to see the Zotac amp at 187 watts as well, because you can see later that it has an utterly overkill VRM solution, so I'm not entirely sure why Zotac crippled it this way. Maybe that's just because Zotac doesn't think the cooler is good enough. Next, there's the EVGA XC cards and the Palette Dual OC and Gainward Ghost OC at 190 watts, followed by the two colorful cards at 200 watts. Above this, there are cards that have the maximum power limits above 200 watts. This is where it gets to the point where it will have even more meaningful impact in performance and overclocking. Unfortunately, if you're expecting the ASUS Strix to top the chart like the other Strix models, that is not the case here, as they're only 210 watts, lower than all the Gigabyte cards at 212 watts. Yes, lower than the basic dual fan Gigabyte card even. This is kind of sad to see for the Strix, being that it's a high-end card. On the other hand, if you want to manually overclock, my answer is basically get whatever Gigabyte card you want as they all have decently high maximum power limits. They're only beaten by the colorful advanced cards at 220 watts. And the king here is the Gigabyte Aorus Elite at 240 watts. If you want to overclock without taking the card apart and doing some shunt mods to remove the power limiter, then this is the card for you, as it will offer the highest overclocking potential without any hardware mods. Considering the RTX 3060 is also pretty low powered, the 240 watt limit is also probably high enough that shunt mods will probably make very little difference on this particular card. Next is the VRM current capability of the cards, where usually a higher current capability comes hand in hand with a higher quality VRM that can last longer. I figured out the card's VRMs either from reviews that show the PCB photos or seeing if a card has the same PCB design as another one that has been pictured. For these, keep in mind that the RTX 3060 at 170 watts TGP runs at about 1.081 volts which means calculating using the equation voltage times current equals power, it will draw around 158 amps, which is sufficiently lower than the cards with VRMs only capable of 225 amps, which seems like the base specification from Nvidia. This is fine for the most part, but I wouldn't flash a higher power limit BIOS or do shunt mods on these cards, as you're less than about 70 amps or 75 watts away from a blown up VRM. I also wouldn't do any shunt mods on these 250 amp EVGA and Zotac cards either. Then there are the 300 amp cards, which I would consider to be safe to remove the power limit with shunt mods, as you'll need to draw over 325 watts to overdraw the VRM, which is really difficult to do on an RTX 3060. I'm not 100% sure on the VRM in the ASUS Dual and Phoenix cards which share the same PCBs, as there are no PCB pictures floating around on the internet. But considering I've never seen ASUS use 45 amp power stages, and that is looking like it is a 6 phase setup, it is probably 300 amps. Next, you can see the MSI gaming cards are also pretty good at 315 amps here. So I'm not sure why they set their power limits so low, especially since they have an 8 pin plus a 6 pin power input. 
Then there are the colorful cards, which I'm not sure if they are 315 amps or 350 amps, depending on the current of their power stages that they use, since they only list the amount of power stage they use on their specification, which is already a big plus compared to the other manufacturers which just leave out that information. But if they use their typical Alpha and Omega 50 amp power stages, just like their other cards, then they are a good 350 amp VRM on their card. Next are the 400 amp Asus Strix and Tough cards, and the Gigabyte Aorus Elite. These are the top end RTX 3060 cards that, in theory, have the best possible VRMs for overclocking potential. The Asus Strix and Tough cards also seem to use Vishe SIC 654A power stages which are a bit more expensive than what the other cards are using. Along with having voltage read points and what looks like a voltage controller I2C connection point for external manual voltage control. Just like their other more expensive Strix and Tough cards. So they are the most suited for extreme overclocking. However, they are beaten by the Zotac Amp card which uses their RTX 3070 Twin Edge PCB with 10 phases of Alpha and Omega BLNO 50 Amp power stages. And that was already a decent PCB on the RTX 3070. So imagine how overkill this is just for an RTX 3060. So I guess if you're doing shunt mods to remove the power limits and as well as maybe some hardware mods to increase the voltage, this card will do great, especially for something like LN2 overclocking. Now for some temperature data, same as before, I compiled the data from reviewers that usually do the most thorough reviews such as Guru3D, Tech Power Up, Hardware Lux, Kid Guru, and Lano C. These last few ones I added because they have a few cards that weren't in the other reviewers list. I ended up not using Tech Power Up's numbers, mostly because Guru3D reviewed the same cards and had more cards in their data than Tech Power Up, so, so there's really no reason to combine the data when Guru3D has all the results plus one extra card over Tech Power Up. So after that, I corrected all the reviews numbers to Guru3D's numbers by calculating the average delta in temperature and noise readings between the reviews for the same cards compared to Guru3D. Again, when I combine the temperature and noise results together like this, it won't be 100% reliable because I'm combining results from different reviewers with different test setups. So this is really kind of a flawed combination of data, but it should be good enough to roughly see how the cards compare with each other. The only numbers that are for sure directly comparable are the ones from the same reviewer which I really suggest to look at their review as well for the full picture, but I do have it in the link down below as well. It also helps that all the cards have a 170 watt power limit, except for the pallet card at 180 watts. So they're dealing with similar heat loads. In this combined chart, sorted by the temperature, the Asus Trix is at the top, running in either modes that are available. The cooler seems to be comparable to the Inno 3D iChill X3, and the MSI 3O cooler might be slightly better, considering the lower noise levels while being basically at the same temperatures. Then the Zotac amp is also surprisingly just as cold, but its noise level is much higher because it has a much smaller dual fan cooler, which means it needs to spin the fans much faster. Although it is still better than any of the other dual fan coolers, as this particular cooler is taken straight from an RTX 3070. The Gigabyte Gaming OC then is a triple fan card that seems to be behind the other triple fan cards. But it is technically better than the Zotac as it is at similar temperatures at much lower noise levels, which is just as expected when you add more fans to the cooler design. Then there's the EVGA XC cards, which kinda surprised me that it can run cooler and quieter than the larger Gigabyte Eagle and Palette Dual cards. Probably because it is actually heavier and has more heatsink mass. The Pallet Storm X then runs up the rear with its simple single fan cooler, which does fine if you really need the compact size. Now I'm going to rank the card's cooling performance, or at least what I predict will be for the ones that aren't reviewed yet. I have also removed the OC versions of the cards as they're exactly the same hardware. And keep in mind that the positions of the cards don't matter, only the rank I put them in. For the S rank cards, the MSI card seems to actually be slightly better than the rest and especially it runs the quietest, but the ASUS, Gigabyte, and Inno 3D cards also definitely have similarly ridiculous overkill coolers for a mere 170 watt GPU, so they'll do really well for sure. Then on the A tier, the triple fan colorful card seems to have the best coolers here, followed by the Gigabyte triple fan cards. The MSI Gaming X uses an extra thick dual fan cooler, 
which I suspect should be similar or slightly better in performance to the thin triple fan coolers on the Ventus 3X, especially as the Ventus is a lower tier MSI product. Next, there are a few B tier cards. These are still great performing dual fan cards, but really are not as beefy as MSI's Gaming X cooler. They should perform more than adequately for the RTX 3060. Now for the C tier, these are lesser performing dual fan coolers. From what I saw, the EVGA seems to be the best in here, even though it is one of the smaller ones, thanks to the heatsink actually containing more metal and using thicker fans than most of the others. In fact, it actually weighs a lot more than the Palette Dual and the Gigabyte Eagle. I suspect this is followed by the Asus Dual, which seems similar in design choices, and then followed by the Palette Dual, Gainward Ghost, Galax One Click, PNY Rebel Dual, and Uprising, which are all exactly the exact same hardware. Then the MSI Ventus 2X and Zotai Twin Edge should be pretty similar as well. Lastly, there are some single fan models from Asus, Gainward, MSI, Palette, and PNY. They should be pretty similar considering they're constrained by a single fan design, but the Asus Pegasus seems to have the beefiest heatsink and has an actual metal backplate, unlike MSI's plastic or the other cards, no backplate at all. And yeah, did I need to mention that all the MSI cards have plastic backplates? And that stretches all the way to their Gaming X Trio lineup, which is kind of disappointing to be honest. Let's put the cards in a tier list. This is my ranking based on the power limits, VRM quality, and cooling performance. It should work well for most people comparing these cards, although if you don't overclock at all, you can just pick whichever card has the best cooler, and if you overclock with shunt mods, you can just pick the cards with the best VRMs and coolers. Also, because I put them into tiers, it is easy to find an alternative in the same tier if a card is out of stock. At least hopefully, once the card starts coming back into stock, which I hope is pretty soon. And yeah, basically I consider the cards in the same tier pretty similar performing overall. Starting with the S tier, the Gigabyte Aorus Elite is at the top of the charts. Thanks to its strong VRM and cooler combined with the highest maximum power limit out of all the cards making it technically the highest performing when overclocked. This is followed by the colorful advanced cards which have a higher power limiter than the Strix cards but has a slightly worse cooler and VRM. The Asus Strix cards then have some of the best coolers, similar to the Asus TUF, MSI Trio, and IGL X3. It also probably has one of the most expensive VRM setup with the voltage read points and voltage controller external control connections, same as the Asus TUF making it suited for extreme overclocking when shun mods. It's just kind of unfortunate that they only use a single 8-pin connector, limiting the maximum power limit that they can provide in the BIOS. Then there are the colorful Ultra cards, which are basically the same as their Advance cards, but with much lower power limiters, even less than the Asus cards despite the dual power inputs. For the Asus Tough Gaming cards, they are pretty similar to the Strix in terms of cooler and VRMs, and much more so than their other tough gaming cards, which are usually slightly below the Strix cards in terms of the VRMs. But this one looks to be pretty much the same PCB. This is probably because it's actually already good enough for a Strix model, but it has a much lower power limiter which will limit its overclocking, much more than the Strix. And speaking of low power limits, in the A tier, there are the MSI Gaming Trio cards, either the X or non-X models which I placed here despite its best performing S tier cooler as a result of MSI using a ridiculously low power limiter despite its very good VRMs and dual power inputs. These cards should really be shunt modded to remove the power limits to unleash the potential of its cooler and VRMs. It just seems like one of those mind boggling decisions that MSI seems to take on their GPUs that cripple an otherwise almost perfect graphics card design. Oh, and to add insult to injury, they also use plastic backplates, which is just unacceptable to me when they're marketed as premium products, because there are lots of cheaper cards that use metal backplates. I know they call it graphene backplates or something, but it's really just plastic coated with a special graphene paint, which is not going to work as well as an actual metal backplate. Then there are the Gigabyte Gaming OC and Vision OC cards, which are basically the same with different aesthetics. They have VRMs and coolers that are not as good as the MSI but have much higher power limiter, which will be good for overclocking even without shunt mods. The next card is the Zotac Amp White Edition. Now this is by far the most off-balance card in this comparison, as it has the most ridiculously overkill VRMs by using the exact same PCB as their Zotac RTX 3070 Twin Edge. 
It is the most powerful by far, capable of up to 500 amps of sustained current, which is really only useful if you do shunt mods and as well as voltage mods to the card in addition to upgrading the B-tier dual fan cooler. So very interesting card for overclockers that want to do LN2 mods for example. Then there are the dual fan MSI gaming cards. These seem to use the same PCB and power limits as their trio models, while not having a triple fan cooler. And yes, it also has a plastic backplate unfortunately, which just kinda sucks. Next is the B tier, and in the first place here I would put the Inno 3D iChill X3, as it has an S tier cooler just as good as the Asus Trix and Tough Gaming, and has a pretty good VRM, but apparently has a non-adjustable 170 watt power limit, which is a shame really, because this is otherwise a pretty good card. Then the colorful Battle Axe card is next, as it's a similar case to the Inno 3D iChill X3, except the A tier cooler is not quite as good as the Inno 3D, because it's just not as large as the Inno 3D cooler. Then the MSI Ventus 3X is similar to the Battle Axe situation again, but the cooler is a bit thinner, which means that it probably isn't as good, in addition to it having, yes, another plastic backplate from MSI. Then I would put the Gigabyte Eagle cards next, as they have a high power limit and a good VRM, just like other Gigabyte cards. But its dual fan cooler and the plastic backplate really leaves more to be desired. In my opinion, it's still a better card overall than the EVGA XC, which has a slightly weaker VRM and a lower power limit, even though it has a slightly better cooler than the Eagle. This next card is kinda weird, since the Gainward Ghost OC and Paladuel OC are somehow the only cards with a stock power limit or TGP set above the 170 watts of the other cards, coming in at 180 watts. But this is about as high as I would place it because its dual fan cooler and the VRMs are basically the minimum specification and weak compared to the EVGA and Gigabyte cards. Then there's the Galax EX card which has a thick dual fan cooler and a good VRM. It should perform pretty well but it gets crippled by a non-adjustable power limit yet again. This is basically the same story with the Inno 3D Twin X2 cards and colorful Battle Axe Duo and the Billy Billy Esports Special Edition, which mimics the Nvidia reference cards pull through fan, which is really kind of cool actually. Then in the C tier, there are a lot of the same cards being branded differently with the Galax One Click, Gainward Ghost, Pala Duel, PNY Epic X Duel, and the PNY Uprising. They're really the most basic of the basics, with a minimum spec VRM, no power limit adjustment, and a pretty weak dual fan cooler. This is followed by the Asus Dual Cards, which has a compact size, and therefore not very strong cooler. But it has an adjustable power limit, same as the Tough Cards, and a good VRM. This makes it better than the Zotac Twin Edge, which has a lower power limiter and a weaker VRM. The MSI Ventus 2X is even worse, as it has a non-adjustable power limit and again a plastic backplate. Lastly, there are the D-tier cards. These are just D-tier merely because they are single fan cards. So they will not be able to cool as well as the dual fan cards in the C-tier, and the ASUS Phoenix is probably the best one here, as it has the same VRM and power limits as the dual cards, while having the most biggest cooler compared to the other D-tier cards. Followed by the MSI Aero ITX cards, which compared to the lower cards at least has a backplate even though it is plastic. The final cards are again a group of exactly the same cards, which are branded differently, in the Gainward Pegasus, Palette Storm X, and PNY Epic X Single. Overall, I wouldn't really choose to avoid any cards in this list, they all should work fine, but one thing to note is to not get the single fan cards if you can fit a larger card in your case, as they will obviously run hotter and louder than the larger cards. Also, personally, I would only get the cards in the B tier and upwards, even if I have to wait or pay slightly more. Just don't end up paying so much more extra money to get an S tier or A tier card if you don't plan to overclock or care too much about the noise levels. As all of the cards will basically perform very similarly in games at default settings, just as I explained in the beginning, because of the 170 watt TGP that seems to be enforced on all but two of the cards. And those 180 watt Palette Dual OC and Gainward Ghost OC cards should still basically perform the same because 10 watts extra is not exactly a game changer in terms of performance. So the best card overall is the Gigabyte Eros Elite, but if you'll do shunt mods and remove the power limits when you overclock, then any of the cards with a VRM at or above 300 amps and a good triple fan cooler will do just as well. Especially when overclocking is heavily influenced by Silicon Lottery, not just the card's design. 
If you want to do more extreme overclocks, then maybe the Asus Strix or Tough Cards are for you since they have more advanced features with the voltage read points and voltage controller external control connections. For my pick of the best all-rounded card, I think the Gigabyte Eagle cards are a great choice as it is usually the more affordable cards out of the rest, which is really important for a cheaper GPU like the RTX 3060. Sure, it might not have the best cooler since it's just a dual fan cooler, but an RTX 3060 GPU isn't exactly a fire-breathing monster either, and you don't need the GPU running at 60 degrees Celsius. Plus it has a really high power limit and the VRM as good as the higher-end Gigabyte cards, which means it's actually a pretty good value, and it's also good for normal overclocking without messing with shunt mods to remove the power limiter. For those not planning to overclock, I think the best card is the MSI Gaming X Trio since it has the best cooler, which runs the quietest, and you probably wouldn't care about the low power limit. And for those of you just saying, well I want any RTX 3060 that works, then like I said before, any of them will work fine, so just buy the cheapest you can find, they'll work just fine as an RTX 3060. Also again, as a reminder, make sure to check out the link in the description for the Google Sheets file which has all the GPUs listed and will be updated if I find new information, which I'll probably also pin in a comment down below. That is it for this buying guide and I hope you found it useful and enjoyed watching this video. If you do find it useful, maybe click the like button and help share the video to others looking for an RTX 3060, as that helps me out a lot. Oh, and if you have one of these cards, do use the GPU-Z tool from TechPowerUp to upload your BIOS, because it really does help me out a lot to do research on these cards. Lastly, subscribe to my channel for more buying guides like this and other computer videos. Thanks for watching.